I'm Frank Rahad. I'm the Vice President of Wealth Management here at Connecta. And as mentioned, I'm very excited for us to be bringing you part four of our series and its strategies for protecting your retirement income, Medicare and long-term care. So I am not gonna speak anymore. I'm gonna hand it over to our first speaker, Mr. Eric Johnson, um, who is our LPL financial advisor and our Medicare specialist here at Connecta. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you for sharing this incredible information. Um, you and Paul together. So I will hand it off to you and then ultimately to Paul. If anyone does have any questions, we'll be taking those questions at the end of today's session. Simply on the bottom, hit your raise hand button. We'll ask you to unmute and ask your question. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frank, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you for attending this evening. I'm gonna hopefully provide you with some information that will help you make some more better informed decisions regarding your Medicare choices coming forward. So um, let's cut to it. Medicare, what is Medicare? Medicare is a federal health program that's provided to those that are turning 65 and older. This program allows you to decide what medical path you'll choose in choosing your Medicare insurance. Oftentimes, people that are disabled uh, can attain their coverage early. However, it's typically for age 65 or older. If you're currently receiving Social Security benefits and are disabled, Medicare actually automatically signs you up for uh, your benefits at 65. So that's basically the parameters that you fall into at the time, and uh, we proceed on. Medicare is basically made up of four parts. Four parts basically identifying two ways to access your Medicare. So don't forget, there's two ways to access your Medicare, basically made up of four parts. Let's take a look at those parts. Part A, what is Part A? Part A would be your people responsible for providing the health care for you. It includes inpatient hospital care, skilled nursing care, also limited home health care, also some degree of hospice care. Now, I need to identify the fact that it does not provide long-term care. Long-term care is something that you have to pay for or establish resources outside of uh, Part A. Now, Part A, generally, if you've worked 10 years or 40 quarters, it's an entitlement. You typically don't have to pay a premium associated with Part A. It's all those FICA taxes you've paid over the years. So typically there's not a cost associated with Part A. Part A, again, is part of the fee for service base that's provided by the government. So uh, it doesn't provide all costs, but just a majority cost of your uh, hospital-related care. Part B, Part B is that other part of the fee-based service that provides your actual um, individuals, the people responsible for providing those health care services to you. It's the doctors, it's the emergency room physicians, it's the RN, it's the radiologists, all those people involved in your care. Uh, your visits to the office, uh, any type of wheelchair, canes and things of that sort, and any medically necessary service that might arise. Also, it includes your preventative um, services, such as screening, your annual uh, wellness check, vaccines, and things of that nature. Now, typically, if you are receiving Social Security, that cost associated with that monthly premium is deducted from your Social Security payment. So, those that are receiving Social Security payments will have that deducted automatically. You do have a choice to set it up directly coming out of your Social Security or from your checking account to choose to do so. So as I mentioned, you have Part A for your hospital, Part B for your people involved in the Medicare process. Keep in mind, it's a 80% cost that Medicare takes care of and then you have a remaining 20% gap that you're responsible for. 
Okay, so let me give an example. Any uh, Medicare approved cost, let's say a hypothetical $100,000, in that scenario, 80% of $100,000 would be $80. You could potentially have $20,000 associated with that cost because of that 20% gap that exists in Medicare. So oftentimes with Part A and Part B of original Medicare, you include a supplement plan. Why do you include a supplement plan? Well, you need it to cover that gap, that potential hole in that scenario that I mentioned earlier. So Part A, Part B, and you have a gap insurance that you purchase to supplement that gap. Part C, what is Part C? Part C is a combination of Part A, B, and D. D we haven't discussed, but it will be in the next slide. D would be your drugs. So Medicare Advantage Plan C offers you a bundle, and what it does, it contracts with a privately insurance company, Medicare approved, and it says we're going to deliver all of those services to you in one bundle. Now, in doing so, typically you lose access to all the doctors you want in a traditional original Medicare plus A and B. In a Plan C, you have to go within your network. But within their network, oftentimes you get additional services like dental, vision, hearing, and extra benefits like gym membership that you don't get in original Medicare Parts A and B. Also with a Medicare uh, Plan C, it does provide you with additional benefits that might lower your costs on a monthly basis. It might provide you with other incentives to, let's say, stay well. So Part A, Part B, Part C, Medicare Plan C, a bundle, and it, again, provides extra benefits. Let's go to Part D. Part D. As I mentioned, your Medicare includes A, B, C, and D. Part D would be your drug plan. Now, if you decide to stay in original Medicare, Part A, Part B, you will need a drug plan. If you don't have a drug plan, they will penalize you 1% for every month you delay for not setting up a drug plan during your um, enrollment period. But your drug plan will basically be designed based on your needs. Every drug plan varies based on individual needs and concerns. Um, with Part A and B, you'll need a drug plan. I mentioned earlier about a supplement plan to cover the gap. But in a Medicare Advantage Plan C, drug plan is oftentimes included in that plan, that bundle, as I mentioned earlier. And what determines that? Pricing varies. It varies based on your location, varies based on whether or not you get generic versus prescriptions, whether or not you receive it 30 versus a month supply versus quarterly supply. So a lot of variation right there regarding the drug plan. But it's all by design. The Medicare process is all by design. And, again, these drug um, Plans are Medicare-approved private companies. Um, you may have heard of them out there, various Aetna's, Kaiser's, and things of that sort, uh, insurance providers. Now let's proceed to the next slide, please. Your initial enrollment period. This is a very important period within everyone turning 65 life. Why? Because it gives you an opportunity to decide what way you want to choose your Medicare services. How do you want your health care services? If you decide that you like the luxury of seeing any doctor you want that takes Medicare throughout the country, any location throughout the United States, then you would consider original Medicare, parts A and B, drug plan, and consider supplements to cover the gap. That's if you want flexibility. If you have, I would say, predetermined issues in the family as relates to a history of, of uh, prostate cancer, 
then I might decide to go with that plan because it'll give me the flexibility, the options of going to any doctors I want. Now, if I'm relatively healthy, like the HMO process, and like to work within the structure process where I have referrals and I have a primary care physician, I might consider the Medicare Advantage plan. But what makes this time important for you is that any pre existing conditions you're not held responsible for. So if you know you have a history of cancer then in the family and you want flexibility, it gives you a choice to do the parts A, B, supplement, and D plan. If you know you're very healthy, longevity, you like the maintenance process, then you can choose. So what does that mean, initial enrollment period? It means one uh, Three months before, one month you turn 65 and three months after. So you have seven months to make that decision. So it gives you a window to decide and lock in your choice. That's your initial enrollment period, very critical. Again, as I mentioned, when you turn 65, you'll have three months before the day you turn six, the month you turn 65, and subsequently three months thereafter. So it gives you a lot of time to make that decision, do the research, follow up, check with your doctors, find out what you want to do. And in the case of those that are disabled, anytime you're determined disabled by Social Security, it's the following month, uh, the 25th. And in any scenarios, you're engaged in where you've been diagnosed with, uh, if you will, dialysis, um, then you immediately become available for uh, Medicare services and so forth. Next slide, please. You have another period, and this is another period if you sign up for the Medicare Advantage Plan C and you decide you want to make choices. You'll have January 1st through March 31st annually to disenroll Medicare Advantage Plan C and go back to original Medicare uh, Parts A and B and change drug plans. So you have an opportunity first of every year if you're a Medicare Advantage Plan member to make choices and make changes going forward. As I mentioned earlier, it's important that you don't delay in signing up for Medicare at 65. Now, I need to let you know this. If you're working, currently working, and or your spouse is currently working for a company that has a credible plan, a credible plan means a health care plan that's comparable or better than Medicare, you don't have to sign up on your Part B until that time you sever relationships or your spouse uh, discontinue employment, things of that sort. So remember, uh, you have a special election period during that time, but you don't have to worry about being penalized for not signing up. Next slide, please. This page is probably the most important page for all those currently considering Medicare, in Medicare, looking forward to changes. Let me do a quick review. So the initial enrollment period is that time when you're turning 65. You have three months before, during a month you're 65, and three months thereafter. You're fresh to Medicare. You have a chance to choose which way you decide to go. The annual election period, that's the AMP. We are currently in AMP. If you take a look at any of your commercials right now, you see all the different actors and individuals representing various uh, insurance companies from United Healthcare to Humana to SCAN to all the various other uh, uh, Medicare and, and uh, advantage providers. Between the 15th of October and the 7th of December, you can change. You can change back and forth. Always keep in mind, though, if you change and decide to go to a different supplement plan, things of that sort, you may have to go through underwriting and pricing and things of that sort. You always have open enrollment towards the first three months of uh, every year, as mentioned earlier, 
which means that if you sign up under the Medicare Advantage Plan C program and you decided to make some changes and go back to original Medicare and, and drug plan, you can do that uh, come open enrollment period. Now lastly, as I mentioned, anyone that's 65 or older currently has a program, currently working with an employer that has a plan that's credible or a spouse, and at any point that you choose to terminate that or the company terminates it or you retire, you'll have anywhere between 6 to 12 months depending on that special election period. It varies with individuals. It varies with uh, other uh, circumstances uh, that I can go into detail later. But these are four primary dates that is applicable to everyone that's considering uh, Medicare. Now, I know there's been a lot of information to digest. I'm going to provide my name and email address in the following slide. If you have subsequent questions and you want to follow up regarding your specific situation, feel free to contact me. Thank you. And we have now Paul Smith. Paul Smith is our insurance specialist. Paul Smith comes with a merit of experience and insight into insurance. So, Paul, thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for that great information. I hope that was helpful for everyone that had questions about Medicare. I'm going to leave this slide up just for a moment. If you want to do a screenshot for this or take your phones out, and take a picture of that so you have Eric's contact information. We'll show it again towards the end, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here just for a moment so you can do that. And as I do, I also want to reiterate at the end of the presentation, when I've completed my section and we talked a little bit further about long-term care, you're going to have the ability to ask questions of Eric, of me, uh, of our group, whatever you'd like. And what you'll see at the bottom of your screen is a way to hit a button that says raise hand. Uh, when you raise your hand, we'll call on you verbally. You'll hear your name announced. And then look for a little red microphone with a slash through it. If you click on that, it'll unmute you and we'll be able to hear your question. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and move on and we'll begin our section on long-term care. You know, um, I should say on the front end, as a way of introduction, I've been doing this now for uh, for 35 years. And uh, during that time, most of it has been including long-term care insurance. And I look back at that time, boy, it goes fast. And uh, I remember when long-term care insurance really first happened. And it came about because it was clear that Medicare was not going to be able to be have the funding to cover long-term care expenses, except for one small piece, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so I've been able to see the full iterations of the products throughout, and we'll talk about how those have evolved over time. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to touch on the areas that we're going to talk about in this short presentation about long-term care and uh, talk about how this an impact of a long-term care event can affect your retirement savings and especially your retirement income. Uh, a lot of you already know what this answer is, but we'll look uh, shortly at what long-term care really is and perhaps what it's not. The likelihood that you're going to be needing care. So from a preparation perspective, what can you expect? Can you expect to, to have this happen to either you or your spouse? What the length of care would be both for men and for women, a little bit different for each, and then eventually what the cost of care is going to be. Uh, and then most importantly, how in the world are we going to pay for this? So if you look at long-term care, just like Medicare, as being a part of preparing for retirement, consider this. Think about for most of what you've done in preparing for retirement was during your working years. And frankly, that was, that was fairly easy. It was just a function of saving as much money as you possibly could during those years. So when you did retire, you'd have enough to last you throughout your retirement. Now, the, the interesting part about that is as you get to the top and you retire and you hit that magical mark, congratulations, when you begin your retirement years, there are some issues there that need to be considered. 
Because again, ultimately what you're trying to do is to make sure that your money is going to last as long as you need it, both for yourself and for your spouse. So having enough money in retirement, as I said, primarily that's a function of how much you've been able to save, but it's also along the way, how you diversified that, how you paid attention to taxes, how you made good selections that gave you good growth, but didn't have too much risk where you maybe had some periods of loss as well. And I know you've been able to accomplish that in working with advisors. Hopefully you've had the good experience of working with uh, our superior advisors here. But as you get into then uh, the phase of, of taking that money, of using that money in retirement for, for income, some of the things that you need to consider, uh, you maybe you didn't know that we're going to be part of that thought process. Let me give you a good example. Several are going to be retiring from a firm who will offer you a pension. And you may have three choices with that. The first one is to, frankly, not take the pension, just to have a lump sum given to you and allow you to invest that and use that all the way through retirement. Another one might be to have a guaranteed income just for the person who is working there. Let's say the husband's working at, at uh, this particular employer and he takes guaranteed income for the remainder of his life. But there's also another choice and that would be to take income also for your spouse. So as you go through that, there are a lot of choices that come up, and it reminds me of one. In fact, this is one that our advisor uh, for Connecta had worked on several years ago, and she had uh, one of our members approach her and said, look, I'm retiring. I have that choice she's been talking about with my pension. I can either take the lump sum, you do take guaranteed income for myself, or do it for both myself and my spouse. And they like the idea of the guaranteed income for their particular purposes but they were concerned that it may not be as high as what they thought it was going to be. So they approached our advisor. The advisor said, you know, there's something else that we can do. You can take that lump sum, apply that actually to an insurance policy and have guaranteed income both for you, uh, the husband and for the wife. And they found that that income stream was larger than what they would have had had they stayed with the pension. So the, the lesson to be learned here is make sure you are working with advisors and exploring all your options so that you know you're making good choices as you do uh, go down through the rest of retirement. That includes the expenses. Uh, healthcare costs, as you know, are accelerating and continue to accelerate. And as we go into what we call the, the silver tsunami, as baby boomers are now getting to the point of not only retirement, but having more substantial health care needs, um, you need to make sure you're maximizing what you receive from your Medicare. And that's um, where we're going to find air comes into place for you and will help with those questions and those needs. And then the final one and the issue that I'm going to focus on here for the next couple of minutes is long term care costs. And the long term care costs can be the most substantial that you face during retirement, as you'll see. First of all, let's talk about what long-term care actually is. Uh, if you look at the services available to you, there are really two. Uh, one would be as you, uh, as you age and our bodies break down, maybe uh, you have an illness, maybe you even have a fall, uh, perhaps you need physically, you need someone to help you with what we call activities of daily living. And that would be, you know, grooming, be able to uh, transfer, go for your bed to a, a wheelchair, basic mobility issues. And uh, that's where you may need to be able to have services in the beginning. It may only be for a couple of hours a week, but that can com uh, compress over time. The other list of services are those that are cognitive. And typically this comes from dementia. And I know we've all heard of Alzheimer's, uh, it's something that's not frequently talked about, unfortunately, but it is on the rise along with several other dementias. Um, Alzheimer's is particularly damaging because it can last for quite a long time. And uh, in today's world, even after you've been diagnosed, uh, most will live on an average of eight to 10 to even 12 years kind of like Ronald Reagan, we might remember. So both of those services uh, for that are what are available to you. What types of facilities are there? As I talk to people and I've worked with people, you know, over the last 35 years, 
Uh, most will say up front, you know, I'd rather be at home. Understandably, you'd rather have someone come in and help you with whatever you need at home. And normally, uh, especially with the help of, of those in the family, this is something that works out well in the very beginning of a long-term care event. Uh, as things progress, however, and the needs rise, especially because eventually there becomes a fall risk. And the fall risk may be the single greatest risk to the individual uh, because that can add a fall that can, that can break down your capability of doing things on your own, both physically and mentally. So then the beyond being at home for care, the other facilities that are available would be to be in a long-term uh, care facility, assisted living is typically what they're called, or in a skilled nursing facility. And the skilled nursing facility normally is something that will happen when, uh, let's say that you fall, you break your hip, you go through reconstructive surgery. The uh, physician you're working with puts you into a skilled nursing facility to help you rehab. Well, what's going to happen is, and Eric kind of alluded to this before, uh, you're going to have Medicare. It will help with that for the first roughly 60 to 100 days, 100 days being the maximum. After that, um, and most often even a bit before that, the skilled nursing facility will say it's time to go. You either need to go home and get help there, or you need to go to assisted living facility. So now let's talk about the likelihood that this would occur. I mentioned that in the, uh, in the agenda. Uh, currently, if you reach age 65, there's a 70% chance that you're going to need long-term care services. And most often, if you reach the age of 85, there's nearly a 100% chance that you're going to need some help there. Um, additionally, we're saying that uh, of those needing the care, 20% of those will, it, it will last for longer than five years. What's the impact of these long-term care costs now over time? Um, first of all, of course, because of demand uh, with the silver tsunami and, and baby boomers aging, getting to that point, the need for care facilities is gonna grow and already we're facing this. The inflation on the pricing for care facilities is growing rapidly and will continue to rise uh, exponentially. Uh, longer lifespans. We're uh, with medical advances. We're living a longer life. And in situations like that, therefore, remember when I said at age 85, there's almost a 100% chance that you're going to need care. Family dynamics. In the past, this really was something that would remain within the family. Um, several decades ago, it wasn't uncommon for uh, the mother or the father, uh, the grandparents to move back in with their kids, with the kids helping out, the grandchildren helping out. And in today's world, for most, it's just not possible. The first family dynamic that's changed has been where uh, both, both of the husband and wife are working, and that makes it very, very difficult for them to do it. Uh, but beyond that, the busy lives they have with their grandchildren make it difficult for them to provide a steady and significant and ex expectable um, coverage and help with their, uh, with their parents. And then finally, government programs. Um, again, we started with the idea that maybe we would be able to cover uh, and help with long-term care, but it was clear when Medicare began that it was not going to be able to help with that. And all it really does is helping in that skilled nursing facility I talked about, or if you get to the point where, uh, frankly, you're uh, indigent and the income you're living from is from SSI, uh, from Social Security income, from the state, and with that, you have an opportunity to qualify for help with what in our state would come from Medi-Cal. Um, Medi-Cal, to qualify for that care, is uh, taking as much as two years now, and in some cases I'm hearing up to four years to qualify for that. So the problem is, you know, you can't predict when you're gonna need that care, when you're gonna need that, that coverage and that help. So that's one of the problems there. Secondly, uh, when you do um, apply for that help uh, with Medi-Cal, they'll look back 30, um, uh, 30 months 
and see what assets and what income you had during that time. So if you decided during that period that you were going to pass those to your children, for example, maybe put the house in their name, they'll be able to see that. They'll claw that back into your assets and your income, and they'll make it difficult or impossible to qualify. So again, what do the expenses look at uh, look like as we move forward? Uh, what I did on this slide, the $193,908, that comes from being in a private room in a skilled nursing facility. And that gives you an idea of what this can be. For men, uh, sorry guys, I'm in the same boat as you are, but uh, our average need for long-term care is only 2.2 years. At that rate, you're looking at 426, almost 427,000 as a total. For women, it's more like 3.7 years. That number is actually increasing. And in this scenario, that would be about $718,000. And, um, you know, I talked about memory care and the need for care if you do receive dementia, especially Alzheimer's. At, after eight years at that level, we're talking about over um, a million and a half dollars. So it grows very, very rapidly. The, uh, the changes in Alzheimer's are, uh, are scary, frankly. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a handle on the disease. In fact, I, for those that unfortunately have gone through this with their family, you may know this, that uh, uh, there isn't even a 100% uh, diagnosis for Alzheimer's. All a physician can say is that I'm 90% sure and it's a probable Alzheimer's. They can see all the symptoms. They can be nearly sure that that's the case. But until you pass away and an autopsy is, is created, there's no way to know for certain. So we're not even at a point where we can fully and accurate diagnose this, let alone coming up with a cure. And this thing is it's 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 moving rapidly. So we're saying that um, you know as of 2022 is the last time we had this. Six and a half million people, ages 65 and over at Alzheimer's, that number is going to more than double its plan by 2050. There'll be more than 13 million of us with Alzheimer's. So what are the effects of the um, of a long-term care event? How is that gonna affect you and your family? What if you had that sudden need of income? For this because it really is an income problem, not an asset problem. Here's what I mean by that. So if you look at someone who is comfortably living on a budget of about $200,000 per year, a uh, husband and wife, and suddenly let's go back to our Alzheimer's uh, 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 issue that someone's diagnosed with that and very quickly, because uh, it does progress quickly, they need to take out uh, 50 to 70 percent more from the retirement savings to pay for this. What's that going to look like to your retirement? So in this particular situation, this is down out 100,000. Let's say that you're able to comfortably live off of $100,000. And at age 70, one of you is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And it, um, it increases in this particular case. It looks like there's a pretty slow increase in the uh, in the symptoms, but at some point it gets to the point where those that are taking care of that individual can no longer do that on their own. So at age 80, they are brought to a facility. Alzheimer's, as many of you will know, is something that needs to be treated and, and that patient needs to be worked with on a seven day a week, 24 hour a day basis, especially because of issues of falling. So the expense of that is uh, substantial, and that's where that expense rises to a point that makes things very difficult. And that's where the income gap comes in that I talked about. And primarily what's gonna happen is the person that's not affected by the long-term care event is the one that's gonna be struggling from a financial perspective. They're gonna need to live off of uh, much less uh, than they were together originally. So how are we going to pay for this? How are we going to bridge the gap? There are three things you can do. The first is, and what most people still to this day will do, is self-funding. That means going into the retirement investments and looking to um, liquidate some of those investments. Some of the issues that you face when you do it, let's say that you have managed accounts or uh, you know mutual funds. Um, you may find when you need the money and it's time to 
pay that facility or pay that individual that's helping you that maybe there's a substantial downturn in the marketplace, you know, like we had today. Maybe there's a substantial downturn and you're not getting the value for those assets that you want. Uh, perhaps you have annuities and you put those aside to pay for that. Uh, let's say that Alzheimer's, as it frequently does, or especially other dementias, happened in your 60s, maybe even in your 50s. And some of the longer term investments that you had in your retirement profile, like annuities, needed to be liquidated to pay for that. You're going to find that uh, there may be um, expenses because of uh, early liquidation with those products. Cash equivalents, good place to go. You're not going to be worried about the upward and downward fluctuation of the product, but it means by keeping it in cash and waiting for it to be withdrawn to pay for long-term care, you're not getting any reasonable growth from that while you leave it there in cash. So no really good alternative for that. What about government funding? Talked a bit about this, but I want to go into it a little bit more deeply. So again, the only way you're going to receive a government funding with the exception of that time you may be in a skilled nursing facility um, is from Medicaid. And it was designed for the indigent and only if you're on SSI income can you qualify. And when you uh, apply for this coverage, they're going to look back on a 30 month basis to see what assets and what income that you've had 30 months in the past. Another option and the final option would be to leverage funding. And what I mean by that is to use insurance companies to do this. And that's where our, our real focus is today. Several have come to me, especially over the years, and these products have changed so dramatically. In the beginning, the insurance companies and the actuaries they employ to uh, price the products that they use, they didn't know what they didn't know. This is a brand new product to them and nothing scares them more than not knowing how to deal with a particular risk. Uh, and what they found is uh, as things move forward, people use this much more frequently thought and in much greater amounts than they thought. So what happened to those who held those early uh, long-term care insurance products is that the price over time continued to rise and rise and rise to the point where several weren't able to afford it anymore and had to drop it probably at the time they needed it the most. Today, it's much different. Today, we're looking at products that have guarantees. And that means you know and you're guaranteed to know what your premium is, how much you're going to be paying for this, and then what your long-term benefit is going to be when you need it. No matter what it is, you know that what it's going to be and how much you're going to be able to draw down on that, both for you and in many cases for you and your spouse. And you also have a choice of products, and this is how they've evolved over time, where it's not just an insurance product that says, if you need it for long-term care, I'll pay that to you. But it also says, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I've had a number of insurance products in my lifetime, and I paid a lot of premium for benefits that I never used. Well, this is not one of those. If you use what's called a hybrid product, you have the option there to take money that's available for the long-term care. But let's say that you didn't use that. Let's say that you had a fall that I talked about and unfor unfortunately you passed away. There's a death benefit, a substantial death benefit that's available that goes to your kids, to your spouse, uh, to the beneficiaries, if you wanna leave that to your church, whatever that would be in a substantial amount and will go to them tax-free. And then finally, the other choice says, well, later, if I'm going through this and uh, I'm a little surprised by how long I'm living based on how long my parents, my grandparents live. And I'm a little concerned about how much money I have saved. If you need to, you can pull the cash from this and take cash out to help you with your, uh, with your income needs later in retirement. So what are going to be the next steps? How are you going to begin this? Uh, I always talk about this. The, the, the first one is to sit down. Uh, primarily, let's let's say with the two of you, if it's husband and wife, and have that big talk. Talk about, I mean, actually face, especially you guys, I, think, I know it's difficult for those, but it's very, very important that you do this. Talk about what kind of care that you want to receive. Where do you want to receive that? You want it to be at home? You want it to be where you both go to an assisted living facility? Where do you want to have that? How would that look? 
And then once you have a good feel for that, meet with your financial uh, professional, talk to me, go to sources that'll give you an idea based on the kind of care that you wish, how much it's likely to cost. Um, And I'll I'll tell you right now, if you can, take out a, a pen or a pencil and write this down. This is what our industry uses to get a good feel for what costs are uh, across the country, both now and projected later in life. It's a great tool. Um, If you write down cost of care and the company you're gonna get that from is Genworth. So if you write, if you type in your search bar cost of care Genworth, you're gonna have this pull up and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to navigate through. But if you have any issues with that, please contact me on that as well. I'll help you both with your your plan, but uh, also what those costs look like. And explore all options, just like you do with uh, your assets and um, your income at retirement. Explore everything that's available to you. Make sure that you have something that's right for the two of you. And then complete your plan. And um, it doesn't have to be something that's written out that's several pages. You might want to just bullet out, um, hey, for the at least for the first year, I want to try to get uh, care at home. Here are the people I want me to help me with that. And then I want to go to an assisted living facility. It can be as simple as that. But with that, your spouse will know, uh, your kids will know, and whoever you, you designated, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a friend uh, that's going to make those initial calls for you, they'll know. Um, don't forget, I, you know, you could very well have a cognitive event uh, with dementia, and you may not remember what you wanted to do. Uh, and this allows those that are going to help to know what your your path is. And I probably should add to that. Today, if you look at most facilities that help people with long-term care needs, at this point, about half of those that are there have physical needs, have the need for help for transference I talked about, and those, those activities of daily living. And the other half is for those that have memory care issues. And that number is changing. They're telling me that within the next 10 years, it'll probably be 60, 40, 60% uh, memory care and 40% for the traditional long-term care. And then bring your kids in. Let them know what what you're planning. Let them know you've thought about it. Trust me, even if you don't want to tell them all the details, they'll feel so much better and have a great deal of peace of mind to know that you've already thought about it, you've already walked through what you want and you have a plan to address it, especially financially. Uh, They'll love you for that. And with that, uh, the same as we did uh, early with Eric, if you wanna take a screenshot of that or if you prefer to take a picture of that with your phone to get in touch with me, please do so. And what we're gonna do at this point now is to I'm going to stop sharing and we'll open it up for questions.